Hey, EP Statistics. All right, welcome to the third part of section 10.2. We're doing inference for difference of means. In this case, we're going to get to the significance test. So uh, the significance test, you could have um, your null hypothesis that you have a mu1 minus mu2 equals some hypothesized value. The vast majority of the time, in fact, pretty much all the time, and the only way our calculator can do this test is to assume that that value is 0. That the difference is zero, which is the same thing as saying that those two numbers are equal to each other. So we're really testing to see um, whether two 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 means are the same, or if they are significantly, or if there's a if our data shows a significant difference, and we could reject those being the same. Um, when we go through this process, the conditions are the same. So the data come from two independent random samples from two groups in a randomized experiment. Um, so you could either be the random samples or randomizing, um, but it has to be randomness to make sure we can trust those X bars. Uh, when the sample uh, sampling without replacement, we need the sample size to be less than 10% of the population, and then we need the normal large counts for each sample, either the population or the distribution of the treatment uh, is normal, or the sample size is large for each sample. Uh, and then if it has, if not, if our sample size is small and we don't know, then we can do the no strong skewer outliers check. All right, so uh, let's set, set up some hypotheses and check some conditions. Um, has the mean number of hours Americans work in a week changed? One of the questions on the general social survey asked respondents how many hours they work each week. Responses from random samples of employed Americans were uh, recorded for 1975 and 2014. They're summarized here. Um, so in 1975, with the samples of 764, the mean average worked is 38.9 uh, with that standard deviation. And in 2014, uh, the average was 14. You know, with this sample size, the average was 14.91 hours with that standard deviation. So it's like on average, maybe there's a you know at least this so far this evidence shows yeah it seems like people are working longer. But is that statistically significant, right? Is that could that just be sampling variability? Did you just happen to get a small, you know, sample that was a little bit lower, a little bit higher? Might they be the same, or are people actually for real working longer? And that's where we're trying to find evidence. Do these data give convincing evidence at the alpha 0.05 significance level of a difference in the true mean number of hours worked uh, hours per week for Americans in 1975 and 2014? State the appropriate hypotheses for performing a significance test. Be sure to define the parameters of interest. So our null hypothesis will be that mu1 equals mu2, or you could write it this way, uh, and they're going to go 14 minus 1975 to keep that number positive, or like, you know, and we could call this mu, mu1 minus mu2 uh, is zero. Um, they're going this way, they're labeling it mu sub 2014 minus mu, to, mu sub 1975 equals zero, and alternatively that it's not equal to zero. That's the same thing as saying they're the same, they're not the same. Where mu, and this should say uh, 1975 is the true mean hours worked per week by Americans in 1975, and this should say mu sub 2014 is the true mean hours worked per week by Americans in 2014. So, sorry, they had that labeled wrong. Um, the next uh, is checking the conditions. So both samples were random, randomly selected. We're going to assume that, well, we know that those are both less than 10% of the population. And they, the population they represent is like Americans in 1975 and Americans in 2014. Um, so uh, they're less than 10% of their respective populations. And the normal condition, well, our sample sizes are very large. So we are all set for the normality condition. Uh, we don't know the shape, but we're, we're fine. Central limit theorem has got us covered. So then to actually do the significance test, we're going to follow the same format we've used before. We're going to use the standardized test statistic, uh, which is you know, Z or T, in this case it will be T, um, is statistic minus parameter divided by standard deviation of statistic. So our statistic is X bar 1 minus X bar 2. Our parameter is mu1 minus mu2, but we're going to assume that's 0. So let me bring this in. Um, so we're going to assume that's zero, since that's what the null hypothesis is, and then that's the um, standard deviation, a really standard error of our statistic. We have to use S's um, instead. So when using uh, when the normal slash large sample condition is met, we can find the p-value using uh, the t distribution with degrees of freedom given by, and so then we got this degrees of freedom for this t. Uh, we can again use that big old ugly formula that the calculator has got programmed in, or the smaller of sample sizes minus one. So 
Um, example here, uh, refer to the preceding example. The table summarizes the hours worked per week in the independent random samples of working Americans in 1975 and 2014. Um, so A, explain why the sample gives some evidence for the alternative hypothesis, and so on. So we'll, we'll start with that. So those two means are not the same. So the observed difference in sample proportions is, sorry, this should say sample means, not proportions. Uh, sample means is... 2014 minus uh, 1975 is 41.9 minus 38.9. On average, people were working on the, in the sample, people were working 2.94 hours longer per week. So that gives some evidence in the favor of the alternative, right? Because 2.94, there is a difference, you know, in our sample, but is it a significant difference is the next question we'll ask. So then the next part we're supposed to do is calculate a standardized test statistic and p-value. So we're going to get that t-test statistic using that new formula. Could also use the calculator, um, and so we will uh, take our mean 14, 41.91, basically that difference we just calculated minus zero. That would be mu one minus mu two. We're assuming a zero, so that difference, and then we want the standard deviation that we would expect from this, and so we're estimating that with our sample standard deviations over their squared over their sample sizes. Plug that all in, you get 4.88. Um, and so that would be our t-test statistic, which we could then do. TCDF with the degrees of freedom, the smaller minus one, so we could do like a 763 for our degrees of freedom, um, and or we could use this in the calculator. So I'll, I'll come back and I'll punch this into the calculator in a second. Um, but uh, that's what they did here. Um, so they used 100 for the degrees of freedom. That's because they're using the table, which is, I don't know, you, you can do that if you want um, to, to estimate that. Um, uh, p value, uh, it's just, yeah, this is all kinds of, uh, of weak. Uh, we'd much rather use our calculator. And if we're going to use our calculator, let's not use the conservative degrees of freedom. Let's actually get these p value and uh, proper degrees of freedom. So let me show you that for a second. All right, so we're going to go into stat tests and we're going to go to two sample t test and we're going to get this data in. So our first mean is, I'm going to go with the 2014 data. So their mean was 41.91 with a standard deviation of 14.35. And their sample size was 1501. And then the 1975 group, we're going to go with a mean of 38.97 with that sample standard deviation of 13.13 and a sample size of 764. Um, and we're just testing to see if it's not equal and we're not going to do the pooled thing. Um, we're not assuming the standard deviations are the same necessarily. Um, and some books actually will pool on this two sample. They're assuming that they're the same standard deviation, but no, we don't, we should never have to do that. Um, so, and then we go to calculate and we get our t-test statistic of 4.88. 07, which we were able to calculate already before, but then we get this p-value of tiny number. Don't don't forget about the e to the negative six. So that's really point, and then it's five zeros, and then one one five, uh, and that's our p-value. And then notice our degrees of freedom is this sixteen sixty. So yeah, right there, uh, that tiny p-value and that 1660. We can get that using the two sample t-test in our calculator. Uh, and then finally, our conclude. So uh, what conclusion would you make at an alpha level of 0.05? Because that tiny, tiny p-value is much less than 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis. There is convincing evidence. So that two difference of two was really significant, especially since we had such big sample size, we were able to tell that that's a significant difference. So there is convincing evidence of the difference of a difference in the true mean hours worked by Americans in 1975 and in 2014. So to kind of summarize this stuff up, um, there's a two sample t-test for the difference between two means. Suppose the conditions are met to test the hypothesis mu1 minus mu2 equals zero. We compute the standardized test statistic. So statistic minus parameter over standard error statistic, get a t-test statistic. Find the p-value by calculating the probability of getting a t-statistic this large or larger in the direction specified by the alternative hypothesis. Use the t-distribution with degrees of freedom approximated by either option one using the technology, which is what I'll do, or the smaller of n1 
minus 1 and n2 minus 1. So we got one more example. I'll try and go through this pretty quick with you. They actually have raw data in there. Does increasing the amount of calcium in our diet reduce blood pressure? Examination of a large sample of people revealed a relationship between calcium intake and blood pressure. Such observational studies do not establish causation. So researchers therefore designed a randomized comparative experiment. The subjects were 21 healthy men who volunteered to take part in the experiment. They were randomly assigned to two groups. 10 of the men received a calcium supplement for 12 weeks, while the other, with a control group of 11 men, received a placebo pill that looked identical. The experiment was double blind, so they didn't know what they were getting, and the people that are assessing them didn't know which one they had, which treatment they had. Uh, the response variable was is the decrease in systolic top number, blood pressure, for this a subject after 12 weeks. In millimeters of mercury, an increase appears as a negative number. Here are the data. So this is a the, the difference from like the before after so group one um uh that before minus after is uh they went down by seven whereas this person negative four that means they went up and the increase appears in the negative four but then this person went down by 18 and 17 and so on so that's our calcium group and our placebo group uh, we can see those those changes so the the question here is do the data provide convincing evidence that a calcium supplement reduces blood pressure more than a placebo on average for subjects like the ones in this study. So they call them in their state, they're going to call the null hypothesis. They're going to go mu sub C, which is the calcium, mu sub P is the placebo group. So mu sub C is the true mean decrease in systolic blood pressure for healthy men like the ones in the study with the calcium supplement. Notice how they're defining this population. It's the, like those in this study since we're doing an experiment. We didn't necessarily get, we got volunteers. So we can only really infer about individuals similar to the volunteers. So it's kind of a weird population. And mu sub P is the true mean decrease in stolic blood pressure for healthy men, like the ones in the study who take a placebo. Um, so it's kind of like yeah, if we did this for more people and, and you know, or for people like those that take these things. I'm going to use alpha level 5%. So ultimately our null hypothesis is mu C minus mu P equals zero, the calcium doesn't have any different um, difference in terms of how much it reduces blood pressure. And then the calcium difference is bigger. The, the calcium reduction is bigger than the placebo reduction is our, um, our test here. So our plan step, we are going to do a two sample t-test for mu1 minus mu2. Uh, the random condition is met by not random sampling, but random assignment. The 21 subjects were randomly assigned to the calcium and placebo treatments. Note, we do not have to check the 10% condition in this case with experimental design. And then the normal slash large sample, uh, we don't have a large sample, we don't know about normal, so we gotta graph our data, and our data looks good. So our calcium, we can see here, this is the decreases. So a little further to the right, like a little more decrease with the calcium group and blood pressure than the non-calcium group. Is that just sampling variability or, you know, we'll see. Um, so no strong skewness or outliers in that graph. All right, those graphs. So then we go ahead and do the do part of this. So we have our mean, you would actually type these data into list one and list two in your calculator and do one variable stats, list one, one variable stats, list two. You can actually do this all at once though pretty nicely if you do the, the stats option for typing it into your calculator. Um, and so they got this mean, the mean decrease was five, uh, the standard deviation for the calcium group and the sample size, or kind of sample size. Uh, the, the treatment group size. Uh, and then same thing for the placebo group and there didn't change much. We even went up just a little bit and um, the uh, standard deviation and sample size. So uh, it is this five minus that. So that's our statistics minus parameter. We're assuming no difference divided by a standard deviation. So it's that squared over N1, uh, this squared over that one added and then square root. And so we get a t-test statistic of 1.604. If you were to type that into your calculator, two sample t-test should give you a p-value of 0 0.0644 with a degrees of freedom of 15.59. If you go with a smaller degrees of freedom of nine and use table, then yeah, you're just gonna get this. It doesn't even give you a specific p-value in the table. So um, uh, I'd stick with the calculator on this one. So because that p-value is not quite small enough, because the p-value, of 0 0.0644 is greater than alpha, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. The experiment does not provide convincing evidence that the true mean decrease in systolic blood pressure is higher for men uh, like, the, like these who take calcium than for men like these who take the placebo. 
Um, and so then the one more step to this, sometimes you're asked to interpret that p-value. And so that's what they're going to do here, that 0 0.0644. They want us to interpret the p-value you got in part A in the context of the experiment. And so assuming the null hypothesis is true, assuming mu1, sorry, mu c minus mu p is actually zero, there is about a 0 0.0644 probability of getting a difference calcium minus placebo in mean blood pressure reduction for the two groups of 5.273 or greater just by chance involved in random assignments. So that's what the difference is that we observed. And so probably would get that. And then this takes us real quick through the calculator thing. I um, briefly already showed you this. Um, so pooled, shellac, no, you'll get that those values. Um, and then uh, if you type those data into the lists, uh, you'll actually type it in this way. So if you have data in L1 and L2, you can do this test, um, type it in that way. Um, and you'll get a screen that looks like that. So you can try that on your own. Uh, AP exam tip, uh, the formula for the two sample T statistic about a mu1 minus mu2 often leads to calculation errors by students. Also the p-value from technology is smaller and more accurate than the one obtained using the conservative method as a result your teacher, I am recommending that you use the two-sample t-test feature to perform calculations. Be sure to name the procedure, two-sample t-interval for mu1 minus mu2, in the plan step, and you need to report the t-test statistic as well as the p-value. You can't just give one and the degrees of freedom that you used, so that that's clear. So you need to give all three of those numbers that come out of your calculator. Um, and so just another thing, I kind of already mentioned this, a word about pooled. Most software offers a choice of two sample T procedures. One is often labeled unequal variances and the other equal variances. Um, so the unequal variance procedure used for uh, use our formula for the two sample T interval and test. This interval and test are valid whether or not the population variances are equal. So this will always work. Um, it's fine. Uh, the equal variance procedure assumes the two population distributions have the same variance or standard deviation. Uh, this procedure combines the statistical terms, it, uh, it, it, it pools it together, the two sample variances to estimate the common population variance. Uh, the resulting statistic is called a pooled sa uh, two sample t statistic. So their advice is to never use t procedures if you, uh, if you have technology. Uh, that will carry out option one. You can actually get a little more accurate with pooling if you had to do it by hand, but we just don't worry about that. You can do it using that big ugly degrees of freedom formula. So this is a bit, un, you know, the pooled thing is unnecessary. And that is uh, two sample t tests.